Good morning, everyone. My name is, well, as you said, Gabriela Rivera. I'm Alec. I'm Alec. <laughs> And well, our part of research, we did it in Puerto Rico. We actually did two different studies, which I will be talking a bit, which we'll be talking a bit more in depth in a bit. Um, but first, I'll talk to you about a little bit of our background. Oh, sorry. A little bit of the language background. So the language context in which we were um, immersed <laughs> were students immersed in an English speaking, only speaking school in Puerto Rico. The school's name was Coupeville School. And the reason we decided to go to that school was because the school specifically wanted to know if their students are actually learning as much English as they should at the moment because they're immersed in this Spanish-speaking environment. So we decided to do two experiments. The first one is on the lexical level. So the goal is to examine the cognate facilitation effect, which I will explain in a bit. And on proficient bilingual students where their first language is Spanish and their second language is English. And then the second experiment is going to be focused on the sentence level, which we want to see if the same group of participants um, process syntactically ambiguous sentences as a native um, English speaker in their second language. Uh, for purposes of this presentation, we're just going to divide it differently. So I'm going to explain the first experiment while Alex explains the second. Um, but a little bit more about our participants. As I mentioned before, they're, com they're students from Coupeville School. It's an English immersion school in Puerto Rico. And Spanish is the dominant language spoken in the, in the area. The students are from K to 12, but the majority of our participants were um, part of a summer camp. And the field research was actually conducted in the school. Okay. So now I'm going to explain the first experiment, of course, is the cognate facilitation effect. So what a cognate is, words that, are, that have the same linguistic derivation as others. So for example, piano, it's written and it means the same in Spanish. And baseball, in Spanish would be baseball. Um, even though they might be somewhat different in how they are grammatically, you can still see that the similarities, you can get the same idea and it means the same thing. Um, Research has shown that bilinguals process cognates better than non-cognates, faster, sorry. Um, so for example, of words that are non-cognates are table, which in Spanish would be mesa, and door, which would be puerta. So they're completely different and they take a little longer to process this. So our experiment um, consisted of showing our participants some pictures and all they had to do was identify the pictures in their second language, which is English. Um, and what we were measuring was how much time they actually took to, to identify these pictures. And regardless if they showed this effect or not, it was still good um, research to see how proficient our, our participants were getting in English. Um, these are some examples of the pictures that we showed our, our participants. So these three pictures are actually cognates. So in English, flower would be flor and penguin would be pinguino. And then these bottom, the, these bottom three are non-cognates. So for example, clock would be relo, or fish would be pez. And then this is overall our, some of the results. Um, on the y-axis, you just see the response times. Um, on the left box, you see the response times for the non-cognate words. And on the right box, you see the response times for the cognate words. And in the lines in the middle of each box, represent the median of each response time. Um, and as we can see here, they showed the cognate facilitation effect. They are identifying cognates faster than non-cognates. Um, this is a very wide range of participants. We had from six to 17 years old, and maybe we thought maybe it could be, one factor could be the age, so we decided to break it down into two groups. We decided to break it down from six to 14 and 15 to 17 and it had no, um, it, did, it didn't change anything. They both showed the, the effect. Um, and now I guess I'll just pass it to my partner. Sorry. Thank you. So for our second experiment, um, it was our ambiguous sentence processing experiment. So when encountered with an ambiguous sentence, it's possible to make um, incorrect assumptions about what's being said and Sometimes those assumptions require revision later on. Uh, it's been known that adults can often change their original thought, but children do not have the same uh, ease doing this. So uh, a 
phrase that was used in previous research was put the frog on the napkin in the box. Um, this is used because the phrase on the napkin is syntactically ambiguous because of the prepositional phrase. Uh, on the napkin could be a modifier or it could be a destination. So this is an example of how on the napkin could be syntactically ambiguous. Um, <clears throat> so we have, this is our one reference display. There's one frog and there's an empty napkin. So when we're told to put the frog on the napkin, in the uh, on the napkin is ambiguous because it could be a modifier, as in the frog that's on the napkin, and it could also be a destination saying to move that frog to the empty napkin. But when we use the phrase put the frog that's on the napkin, that's an unambiguous phrase because that's on the napkin is very clearly indicating which frog that is being talked about. In our two reference display, there's two frogs. So while put the frog on the napkin, the phrase on the napkin is still ambiguous, but because of our display, it limits the interpretation. Um, so either way, put the frog on the napkin, it should indicate which frog that's already on the napkin, and put the frog that's on the napkin, still unambiguous. So both should indicate the frog that is already on the napkin. It should be interpreted as the modifier. So we did this experiment in visual world, um, and these were our results. So on our x-axis, we have time in milliseconds, with zero being the on onset of the phrase uh, on the napkin. On our y-axis, we have the proportions of fixations to the empty napkin. So in our one reference display, you can see the red line. Um, it's our ambiguous sentence, it's our ambiguous phrase on the napkin. There's an increased number of looks to the empty napkin. Uh, this is not the same in the true reference display. And this is actually the same way that native English speaking adults perform. And this was really important for us because the school that we did our research at was really interested in knowing how proficient their students are becoming in English. So. In conclusion with our research, um, we found that the students are presenting the cognate facilitation effect. Um, it was happening regardless of their age or grade. And we, in the ambiguous sentence processing, we found that the bilingual children were behaving the same way as native English speaking adults. And together, this was really important for the school and for us because the purpose that we went to that school and the school wanted us there was to see if the way they're teaching and educating their students is actually yielding highly proficient English speakers and it turns out that they are. So, sorry. Well, these are some pictures of our experience. Oh, sorry. There we go. These are some pictures of our experience. Um, of course, there's a lot of beaches in Puerto Rico. We have all went to um, El Yunque, which is the rainforest. There's a picture of the face of a Taino. Um, there's an iguana with a hat. <laughs> and that was our stations. We were working with some students. I believe that one, Alec, is doing the cognate facilitation. Yeah, they're both doing the cognate facilitation effect. Um, and overall, it was just an amazing experience. Um, personally, I'm from Puerto Rico, and I hadn't been since 2015. And now that I know like all these things, like linguistic, linguistically, I can, I can appreciate more my culture, and it was really nice. So. Mm. Thank you. And then we'd also just like to say a few thank yous to our wonderful people that helped us. Um, NSF for you know giving us this opportunity, for Katrina, Julie for helping us the whole time with every issue that we had throughout. Uh, Juliana and Jessica for coming with us, helping us while we were there. Um, Heather and Mariam for dealing with a lot of Pyre students. It was a lot of logistics to coordinate. Um, we just really appreciate it all. Thank you. Thank you.